Well, there's a real crisis of meaning. Yes. You know, I'm an Oxford man, yeah. and I was disturbed. The Oxford has a series, the short introduction too. Mm -hmm. And the one on the meaning of life starts by saying, the meaning of life is a topic only for madmen and comedians. Wow. Now, that's absolutely loony. Yeah. <laughs> because every, our conversation assumes meaning. We right. can talk to each other. Everyone talks about climate change. Right. But he talks about cultural climate change, mm. Mm. which is far, far worse. Mm. Mm -hmm. On the one hand, the death of truth. Yes. You think of postmodernism. Yeah. God is dead. Yeah. Truth is dead. There's no meaning. Everything's only power. Yeah. So you have the death of truth, and then you have the erosion of all social ties. All right. And that combination is absolutely deadly for society. Yeah. Now, it makes sense if our creator calls us. Calling is not just be who you are. That's important. No. It's become whom you can become. Yes, right, exactly. And if you know God's calling, you rise to a level higher than you would be yeah. according to any other sense of responsibility. I love that notion. Hello, Oz. Welcome to my podcast. Thanks for having me. You're very welcome. This is Oz Guinness. Oz and I met not long ago. Uh, we've met a couple of times, once in Washington and now here. And uh, I invited him to come on my podcast, and he graciously accepted. Um, I read a book of his called The, the Call, and uh, we'll discuss some ideas from that book. But he also brought another book that's here. Oz Guinness, uh, A Magna Carta of Humanity. This, I'm sure we'll touch on this book as well. And so I, uh, I hope you enjoy. No, a privilege to be with you, Tammy, oh. and I'm happy to try to go wherever you want to go. Okay, well, let's just see how it goes then. So I think the first thing that I'd like to do is uh, just maybe give a brief introduction to my guests about who you are and uh, why you wrote these books. Well, Alf, I'm, I'm a writer. My family's Irish. Mm -hmm. I'm descended from the youngest son of Arthur Guinness, the brewer. Mm -hmm. Although my grandparents were some of the first doctors in China. My grandfather founded the first Western hospital and treated the last emperor and mm -hmm. before him, the Empress Dowager. So I was born in China. My family is Irish, born in China. I was educated in England. I've lived in Switzerland. Mm -hmm. um, and since the 80s, I've been here in Washington, D.C. Oh, I see. Well, you know, that, that's the thing, the, the history of our nations and how international they have been and the, uh, the spread of our knowledge around the globe was ha has been happening for a very long time. And I imagine that has really been instrumental in who you've become, all of that. Well, it was certainly when I was seven year old, mm -hmm. I'll never forget my dad said to me, son, we're in trouble. Chiang Kai-shek has just abandoned the city. We were living in the capital, mm -hmm. Nanking. Mm -hmm. We're at the mercy of the Red Army. So three months wow. later, in came Lin Bao, and then for two years, the reign of terror. So I was there in the Chinese Revolution for the first two years. My dad was tried. It all fell apart because the witnesses, it was concocted and mm -hmm. they didn't agree. Eventually, my parents were allowed to send me back to England, but I experienced the first two years of the Chinese Revolution. What was that like for your mother? Well, my parents, well, they experienced war. The Japanese invasion killed 17 million. Mm -hmm. To stop the Japanese army, the nationalists flooded the Yellow River where we were living, and overnight, 900,000 were killed. They didn't warn their people. Wow. Just wiped them out. Wow. We were then in a famine covered by Teddy White of time mm -hmm. in which 5 million died in three months, including right. my two brothers. Mm -hmm. There was cannibalism, people selling their children for an evening meal. Right, right. right. So my wow. parents saw war, famine, plague, and then, of course, revolution. We lived in Nanking then, mm -hmm. which has suffered the terrible rape of Nanking. Mm -hmm. So they'd seen everything. But I have to say, 
One thing I learned from my dad, he would say, God is greater than all. Mm -hmm. The Lord can be trusted in all situations. Have faith in God. Have no fear. Mm -hmm. And I never, ever, I didn't see them behind the bedroom door, of course, right. but I never, ever saw them waver mm -hmm. in their faith despite wow. the horrific circumstances. Mm -hmm. Well, that's that's real faith, you know, to, to be kept so strong mm -hmm. by your faith. Uh, I can understand how you can do that, but that takes fortitude, right? That takes conviction. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering when you say, you know, the horrific things that ha have happened there and the disillusion that we are in in our society today, I would call it disillusion and misunderstanding and misguided, misguided disillusion. Uh, and the the feeling of people's feel, fe people feeling lost, men and women feeling lost, and also holding on to things other than God, you know, and where that is going to lead us, and where it is leading us. It seems like it's leading us nowhere good. That's what I would say. Well, there's a real crisis of meaning. Yes. You know, I'm an Oxford man, yeah. and I was. Disturbed, the Oxford has a series, the short introduction too. Mm -hmm. And the one on the meaning of life starts by saying, the meaning of life is a topic only for madmen and comedians. Wow. Now that's absolutely loony. Yeah. <laughs> because every, our conversation assumes meaning. We right. can talk to each other, let alone the meaning of life itself. Mm -hmm. And you can see today that there's a crisis of faith and the so-called religious nuns rising all the time and the growth of nihilism mm -hmm. and the fatherless loners mm -hmm. who are taking it out on society. No, that crisis of meaning is very, very deep. Yes, that's for sure. You know, there's a biological finding recently that the telomeres on the chromosomes of boys and the telomeres are the part of the chromosome that says uh, longevity, that signifies longevity. If you have no father, they're 12% shorter mm. for women, and I think 15% shorter for men if you don't have a father. So this, these decisions that we've made to leave the more, the traditional heterosexual uh, wedding, having children, staying together through thick and thin, till death do us part, is, is starting to really come home to roost and in ways that we are, haven't seen the end of yet. You know, we're just... This sick. book that you pointed to, yeah. I dedicated it to Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs, uh -huh. the great rabbi in Britain who sadly died last year. Right. But he has a phrase, you know, everyone talks about climate change. Right. But he talks about cultural climate change, mm. Mm. which is far, far worse. Mm. Mm -hmm. On the one hand, the death of truth Yes. You think of postmodernism. Yeah. God is dead. Yeah. Truth is dead. There's no meaning. Everything's only power. Yeah. So you have the death of truth, and then you have the erosion of all social ties. All right. And that combination is absolutely deadly for society. You take, say, the American concern with the massacres mm -hmm. in schools. Mm -hmm. Everyone focuses on the guns. Yeah. But the really common factor is the fatherless loner. There you go. Right. In, and so on. And you can see they're wreaking their revenge on society and their families and the schools and so on. Yeah. But Americans are not looking at the cultural climate change, which is far more deadly than climate change. You know, when you look back at uh, South Africa and apartheid, and uh, I just interviewed a man named Mark Mathabane who grew up in South Africa. He wrote a book called The Kafir Boy. So it was his life, but till he was 18, living in Soweto and being part of the uprising in Johannesburg. And uh, I interviewed him and he told me that the government was looking to destroy the families, destroy, so to separate the families. That way, the large population of, of uh, native people there wouldn't be able to uprise against the mm -hmm. uh, ruling class, you know, so they knew, they knew. Mm -hmm. It's the, the family is strong. If the family is strong and their faith is strong, then they can overcome. 
we have to destroy that because that is what holds us together. And it's a small community of family. You know, it's the, it's the building block of mm-hmm. your, your community. And we need well, that intact. If you take something like the extremes of the sexual revolution, mm-hmm. you know, a lot of people say went, went back to Hugh Hefner and Playboy right. and the pill and 60s yes. permissiveness, which was significant. Yes. They don't realize it goes all the way back to the French Revolution. Mm-hmm. And the sexual revolution is actually plotted in the same place in Paris, the Palais Royal, that the political revolution came from. Oh, is that right? Yeah. Uh, so, uh, if, I mean, if you read... Tyrannic. Say, the man who gave us the term sexual revolution is Wilhelm Reich mm-hmm. okay. in the 1920s. Yeah. And he's quite explicit. We want to overcome 3,000 years of civilization. Now, it was 1,000 years of Judaism and 2,000 years of the Christian faith. Mm-hmm. And he says, we'll have to have two enemies very clearly. One the family, as you've been saying, Mm -hmm. and the other, the church. Mm -hmm. And so he's suggesting back in the 1920s or H.G. Wells in 1900, Mm -hmm. you know, we need sex education at three and four to sideline parents. That long ago, yeah. Oh, yeah, it's it's all there. Mm. And we should have seen what's coming. Yeah, right. Now, by contrast, in the wonderful roundtable with Jordan looking at Mm -hmm. Exodus, Mm -hmm. you know, the stress is on the household. Right. So and you see table. Israel as a mm-hmm. whole nation, mm-hmm. but household by household. Yeah. And that's so important to rediscover that today, the yeah. strength of families. Yeah. So something in the calling that I was interested in was when you brought up the idea of seeking God, seekers. And that, that is a very popular term these days, that people define themselves as seekers, that they're people that are looking for a better way, that they're looking, maybe they're not looking for faith but maybe they are looking for faith. And um, you described in your book a, a different way to look at um, a pursuit of a more mm, spiritual uh, guidance in your life. And I thought it was interesting, your, the, the differences you talked about uh, made sense to me and made sense to me in my life as well. I've got another book called The Great Quest, Uh which sets out how a thinking seeker Mm -hmm. looks for the meaning of life. Mm -hmm. And the first stage is always a time for questions. In other words, someone's happy. Whatever they believe, parents believe, the culture around them believes, Mm -hmm. they don't particularly think. Mm -hmm. But you remember Socrates, an unexamined life is not worth living. Right. Now, a lot of people don't think enough and care enough to start thinking about the meaning of life. And usually a a question strikes in and life is called into question Mm -hmm. and then they have to find an answer. And that's the important beginning. I see, that's right. So I've got a book describing the phases that Mm. people go through. The first stage is that time for questions. Mm -hmm. The second stage, so logically, a time for answers. That sounds rather simplistic. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But you think today's world, there's a thousand and one possible answers. Right. And some people look at politics and some people look at art with a capital A. But most people realize at the end of the day that philosophy, science, art, politics, they don't answer the deep questions. You have to go to the great world views. And when you think like that, there are only basically three families of faiths. So you have the Eastern family, mm-hmm. Hinduism, Buddhism, the New Age. You have the secularist family, atheists, agnostics, materialists, mm-hmm. naturalists. And then you have the Abrahamic family, and the two big ones in the West are Judaism and the Christian faith. Mm-hmm. And what dif- the difference between the families all goes back to what they consider ultimate reality. Right. So for the East, it's an impersonal ground of being. Mm -hmm. Obviously, for the secularists, it's chance. Mm -hmm. And for Jews and Christians, it's a transcendent but personal God. And the answers flow out very differently, depending which of the families of faith you're looking into. Right. I spent, I, I turned to yoga. My godmother introduced me to yoga when I was 13 years old. And, um, I had been going to a United Church up till that point and uh, stopped going to church, continued to do, do yoga, and continued to do, do yoga every day 
uh, I did Hatha Yoga. I studied Iyengar, which is a, um, uh, a yogi who really was good at bringing you the yoga teachings to the West. He formulated it in courses and you had daily practices. And so it was something I could do on my own. And uh, it, it sustained me for a long time and through, through many years and uh, really gave me a, a feeling of uh, direction. I could direct my intention in the day through meditation. And so I had a good practice of meditation. But when it really came to me hitting a, uh, a personal low in my life, uh, I had to, it was, it wasn't like I had to turn back to my Christianity, but it seemed like that is what came to me. It came to me and said, mm -hmm. here, here I am again uh, at your service. Well, there is a huge difference. You know, I said to you, I was born in China. Yes. So I knew Buddhism. Right. And I was never really attracted to that. In my 20s, I went out, the Beatles went to the Maharishi Mahesh Yogi. Yes. I went out to the Shivananda Ashram okay. in Rishikesh. Mm-hmm. And wrestling and thinking, I suddenly saw the huge differences. So many in the West, you know, yoga mats and exercise, they don't think about the philosophy right. behind it. Mm -hmm. But when you do, it's quite different. Mm -hmm. So you take, say, freedom, or take my book on calling. Mm -hmm. In the Jewish and Christian view, calling is the freedom to be yourself. God has made you in his image, and each of us rises to our highest mm -hmm. to be ourselves as he's created us. Mm -hmm. In the East, in Hinduism, freedom is freedom from individuality. Because mm -hmm. to be individual is to be caught in the world of maya or illusion. And you don't have a high view of humanity no. in Hinduism. And so I think people who look right down the line, they should see there are very important differences, and the differences make a difference. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people just dabble, and they're into it here, there, and wherever, but they don't yeah. think through the whole situation. So Hinduism mm -hmm. would never have produced science. Why it not? Because doesn't, it doesn't have a view of the world that's real. It's illusion. So no objects. No. Right. Equally, it would never have produced human rights. And why not? Because there's no, in Judaism. That has to be an individual. We're, we're made person. in the image and likeness of God. So uh -huh. the poorest right, right. person, the most disabled person, is precious mm -hmm. and unique, made in the image of God. Mm -hmm. Whereas you think the way the Hindus treat the Dalits and other people like that in the caste system. Yeah. They have no grounding for a high view of humanity. I didn't realize that in the caste system, if you're in a lower caste, then you're meant to stay there. Yeah. You're not meant to elevate that this is your karma, and you have to play it out. Exactly. And so that's the understanding, is there isn't any bringing people to a better standard of living in that caste system. Mm -hmm. And karma is almost like fate, mm -hmm. but over the generations. You know, as the Hindus say, just as a calf will find its mother in a thousand cows, so your sins will find you out yes. in a thousand generations. And you have that fatalism. Mm -hmm. Well, in the in the ashram that I visited, I I actually shared a room with a man who claimed to be a friend of Federico Fellini, the Italian wow. filmmaker. Is that right? Mm -hmm. But cool. all the people who are Western, I I think many of them were very clear what they were reacting against: mm -hmm. the noise, the drivenness mm -hmm. of the modern world in the West. But they weren't very clear about what they were getting into. Right. And in the long run, that's the problem. Yeah. Yeah. So stage two is a time for answers. Stage three, the important one, a time for evidences. You've got to say, well, I'm attracted to that answer, but is it true? Mm -hmm. And of course, in the postmodern world, there is no truth. Right. But it's a very, very important one because the only reason to believe anything, finally, is you're convinced it's actually true. Right. And, and that's true. incredibly important. And how do you, how do you investigate if it's true? Well, there are two broad ways, and uh, in my book I tell the story of two great Christians who came to that. Mm -hmm. One was G.K. Chesterton, mm -hmm. and he took the big picture way. Uh, he, he was flirting with pessimism, and as he says, I was stopped in my tracks by a dandelion. 
In other words, the world is dark and broken and cynical, but there's beauty. Mm -hmm. So he had to find an answer that explained the wonder as well as the evil. And to cut a long story short, he came to see that in the Jewish and Christian faiths, the world is good, wonder-filled, because it's God's creation, beauty all around us. But there is evil because of human choices. Mm -hmm. And you explain both. And his description in his book is rather like Eureka. Mm -hmm. He's so excited when he sees all of the bits fitting into place. The other approach, now that's the big picture approach. Mm -hmm. You can say it's mm -hmm. coherence. Mm -hmm. uh, C.S. Lewis, well-known writer, mm -hmm. is the other. And it's close up. You know, one of his friends at Magdalen College, Oxford, said to him, Jack, you should look at the Gospels. Mm -hmm. Great teacher. And Lewis was surprised because there was an atheist who told him to do it. Mm -hmm. But as he looked, he said, you guys have got it wrong. This man who makes these incredible claims, the great teacher, love your enemies and so on, he makes claims which, if they're not true, would make him a madman or a liar. And so he looks at all the evidence in a close-up way, and he says, is he a liar, mm -hmm. Jesus? Mm -hmm. Is he a legend? Is he a lunatic? No. There's only one other option. Right. He is who he said he was, mm -hmm. Lord and God. And that's what led him through a close, detailed examination of the evidence to faith. And yeah. he says, I was the most reluctant convert in England. He mm -hmm. didn't want it. He didn't want any interference in his life. He wanted to run his own life. Right. It was going all right so far. Yeah. But fortunate. Brought to his knees him. by the evidence. Yeah. 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 Right. Yeah. And that's an intellect's way. Yeah. He, no, he's definitely right? a thinker's way. Yeah. Thinker's way. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 And I wouldn't say I'm a thinker. I'm a thinker to some extent, but I was really brought up in my body. Mm -hmm. You know, I was a, an athlete. Uh, I worked with people through massage therapy, right? So I, I was very attuned to uh, my my hands were knowledgeable. I think you know, being an artist, there's a lot of artists in massage therapy because the whole tactile uh, is mm -hmm. is very acute. But living so living with my husband, who was intellectual, and then him living with me, who was more. Uh, in, in sensation, uh, we brought each other, I think, information and knowledge to bring. So he brought me into thinking. Mm -hmm. And uh, I do think that part of my conversion that happened when I was ill and did have God come to me to give me uh, what I needed in the moment um, was brought on by all the lectures that I had sat mm -hmm. in, I think I had sat in 150 lectures mm -hmm. by then, you know, and uh, listened to the thought processes of someone who was arguing out whether this was true. But even with the thinkers and the yeah. intellectuals, there's always an intuitive moment, right? which right. is closer to the artists. Yes, so, yes. You know, one of my favorite stories in the book I've got coming out next year is the Road to Faith of W.H. Auden, mm -hmm. you know, the great 20th century poet. Okay. And when he left Oxford, he mm -hmm. was young, left-wing, and openly gay, and fought on the Republican side in the Spanish oh, wow. Civil War. Oh, interesting. I mean, he was all of that. <laughs> but then when World War II was looming, he came to New York, and there was no television in those days, mm -hmm. so you kept in touch with the news of the war, through documentaries in the local cinema. Right. And he went one Saturday, and the documentary was on the siege of Poland, and Nazi stormtroopers were bayoneting women and children. Unbeknownst to him, the audience was largely German. And, of course, being in America, America was neutral. Mm -hmm. The Germans supported the Germans, and the Anglo uh, British supported the British. Mm -hmm. And the audience cried out, kill them, kill them, egging on their own people. Wow. And Auden sat there in the darkness and he said in five minutes, his world was turned over. He'd always right. said there were no absolutes. Only the uneducated believe in absolutes. Mm -hmm. He said, but I looked at that. Hitler was absolutely wrong. Mm -hmm. But I couldn't say it. 
But I had to say Hitler was absolutely wrong. Mm -hmm. So he said, I left the cinema a seeker after an unconditional absolute and came to faith. Mm -hmm. Wow, wow. It it, it wasn't a rational hours discussion. Yes. Intuitively, he knew he needed something beyond his atheism at that stage allowed him. Yeah. And he came to faith. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, I think, oh, geez, you just never know how it's going to happen to you and, and what, what is going to bring you there. But I would say that I fought against it a long time. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I was pretty headstrong. I was very self-sufficient, <laughs> or thought I was. I thought I was self-sufficient for a very long time. And uh, although I wanted belief in my life, I didn't feel the necessity and I wasn't given really the grounding in it that was sufficient to uh, to bring it on until there was a real need. But boy, mm-hmm. when there was a need, there it was. Yes. Right? You know, my book, The Great Quest, is uh-huh. on the journey to faith. Uh-huh. But the call is on the journey of faith. Yes. Because obviously, once we come to faith, then the rest of our life yeah. is lived out as a great venture. Yeah, and that's uh, why I like this book, I think, mm-hmm. is because I've come to faith. And so every chapter, as you said, is a, a daily reflection, mm-hmm. you know. And uh, I read it kind of fast because I wanted to talk to you <laughs> and I wanted to have read something, so I read it kind of fast. So I had uh, a moment this week. I was reading your book, and I think I had... You know, I don't think I'd read the chapter that morning, but that morning uh, my husband was planning a trip to see his parents and he only has three days or something and he has to fly like 2,000 miles. And he was going to do that, but then he wants my son to go see them because they're getting old. They're about 85 years old and they're pretty healthy, but my son hasn't seen them for some time. And so he asked them if they would come if he chartered a private flight. And I thought, I just went to see my father. He's 91, dying. And I took a pri- I took a public flight and the airlines are so terrible that through customs, I missed my flight and had to get up at four o'clock in the morning the next morning again to get the rest of my flight. I said, you know, how I said to myself, why can't I have a private flight? Mm-hmm. You know, and felt this envy. And then I thought, and then I read this chapter on, on envy and it, and you talked about desire, that, that if you're not aware of what you desire, it can turn into envy. And I thought, you know what? You know what it is, actually? It's that I want to be with my grandchildren. And th- mm-hmm. my desire to be with my grandchildren is so strong that being with Jordan on these tours is quite a challenge for me because I'd mm-hmm. rather be home with my grandchildren. Mm-hmm. And he was going to take his grandchildren up north in this plane, and I had already committed to doing something else that I needed to do. But really, I could delegate that. You know, I could delegate that. And in my conversation with Jordan, he said, well, you could come. And I thought, oh, yeah, I could come. And in fact, that is my problem, is I had a desire that I wasn't allowing myself to uh, contain. I wasn't allowing to express that desire and, and take it and, mm-hmm. and, and love it, you know, well, envy is an incredibly subtle Oof, one for it's us all. Subtle, yeah. For everyone, but mm-hmm. if you think, in, in, particularly in North Amer- in North America, on the one hand, consumerism. So behind consumerism is what they call mimesis. Okay. That people desire, not just desire. That's obvious, but they desire what others desire. Right. So we're taught to think of what others desire. Yeah. We want what they have. And so on. So the whole of consumerism is in a way built on that. Or you think even worse of the radical left and the whole notion of cultural Marxism. Oh, right. You identify oppressors and victims and you appeal to resentment. Yes. And it's just e- e- envy in a very ugly political form. And yeah. it's absolutely poisonous. Yes, it's so poisonous. And you can see how that's running through American society and other countries yeah. in the West too. So envy is an extraordinarily important thing to yes, wrestle with and deal with in our own lives. Yeah. And resentment. And the resentment is also misplaced desire. Mm-hmm. Right? It's it's un it's unfulfilled desire. Resentment. It's 
that someone has denied themselves what they need, and so then uh, it just bru- it just sits inside you and causes. And terrible- it's a form of victim playing where we yeah. lose the sense of responsibility. Yeah, you know, one of the glories of calling. Mm-hmm. You know, Jordan says a lot about responsibility. Yes. But the big question is, all right, responsibility, responding to what? Yes, right. To society, to my own sense of what I should be? No, the highest responsibility is responding to God's call. Yes, your inner desire, what, what, is, what is calling you. That's what the desire, that's the only desire that is going to be fulfilling and keep and take you to a place of peace and serenity. You know? No, it makes sense if our creator calls us. Calling is not just be who you are. That's important. No. It's become whom you can become. Yes, right, exactly. And if you know God's calling, you rise to a level higher than you would be Yeah. according to any other sense of responsibility. I love that notion. I do. I love that notion too. And I love also Jonathan Pajo taught me that the Garden of Eden is at the top. It's at the top, and as you, as you wander away, as you wander away, because there's this oneness at the top, this single, this single guidance at the top. As you wander away, the categories start to get muddled. Everything is clean and and orderly at the top, and it gets disorderly and mixed up. And this is where you find the. Uh, the monsters and the gar- gargoyles and the the animals that are all mixed together and not uh, not pure anymore. So it dis- it's a it's a disillusion of the categories as you get further and further away from God, mm-hmm. which is I think what we're seeing. Or put in, in Western time. terms, the disorder comes out socially, politically, educationally. Yeah, you know, right across the board, uh, yeah. we're seeing the chaos. Yeah, and we're seeing it. Every, I can't believe that we're seeing it. We're seeing it in ed- education. We're seeing it in the home. Now we're seeing it in the body. I personally believe we're in a what the historians call a civilizational moment. Right. In other words, every great civilization has an inspiration and a dynamic. Mm-hmm. And there's a point at which in every case they lose touch with what made them great. Mm-hmm. And clearly the West, yes. the Christian and Jewish faiths, made the West, mm-hmm. and we've almost lost touch with them. But in a civilizational moment, you have three options, either renewal, whatever originally inspired them, or replacement, or decline. And they've tried to replace. That's what, in the 18th century, secularism in the Enlightenment mm-hmm. form tried to do. And more recently, you see cultural Marxism and other things like that. Mm-hmm which are not only trying to replace the Christian faith, they're against the West altogether. Yes. And that's why they're so radical and disastrous. Yeah. I find, though, I I don't know about Canada, here in America, Mm -hmm. Christians or conservatives, they they don't think deep enough. Well, they've never had to. No, they haven't. They're just resting on their oars of prosperity. Well, it was always a given. Yeah. And, you know, our wonderful new governor got in because of a huge uproar over critical race theory. Okay. But when that happened a couple of years ago, many people had no idea what it was. Right. And then they said, oh, yes, it goes back to the Harvard Law School in 1970. I said, don't you realize this goes back to Antonio Gramsci in the 1920s, which is a variant of Marxism. It's not classical Marxism. It's a form of cultural Marxism. But it's absolutely deadly to the American experiment and to the West as a whole. And yet it's sweeping many of our countries. Oh, yeah, no Canada. And many people ju- the they don't know the roots of these things. Mm-hmm. And also, I went to visit my father, you know, and he's 91 and his girlfriend is 87. And I talked to them and they're completely misguided by the, or my, at least my dad's girlfriend is completely mis- misguided by the, the news. And, and telling her that uh, climate change is of the utmost importance and that uh, we have to limit, you know, our consumption. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, that this is, a, this is a disaster for everyone. It, and she's well-read, actually. She's well-read. 
But yet it's very hard to stay in touch when, when you, because, you know, we've trusted our institutions. We've, in Canada, we've trusted our institutions. We trusted our hospitals, our governments, our school systems, you know, our medical systems. We trusted them all. And now to believe that those things are all corrupt is such a huge leap for people that it's very, mm-hmm. well, it's inconceivable for them to think that way. No, absolutely. Uh, but many of them, you know, a simple way of introducing people uh-huh. is the notion of the long march through the institutions. I right. don't know if you've heard of that. I have, yeah. I first came here to the U.S. in 68. Mm-hmm. Martin Luther King had been assassinated. Senator Kennedy was assassinated. Right. 100 American cities were ablaze, mm-hmm. far more than 2020. Mm-hmm. And yet the radicals knew they wouldn't win in the streets. So Herbert Marcuse and a German radical, Rudi Deutschke, called for a long march through the institutions. In other words, win over the colleges and universities slowly, the press and the media slowly, Hollywood and the entertainment industry slowly. Mm -hmm. Then you sweep round and win the whole culture. So here we are more than 50 years later. They've done it. Yeah, they've done it. So when I was a student, the danger was classical Marxism, the talk of the proletariat and the bourgeoisie and yeah. words like conscientization, they don't work. So through the long march, everything now is woke. Yeah. And they've changed the language even to make them much softer. But the long march has been incredibly successful, yeah. as you know so well, with all that's hit Jordan and Jordan's exposed in it. Yes, that's but right. But most people don't think deeply enough to understand where it comes from and the full range of what we're facing. Well, you know, when I was ill, I asked God if he let me live. I told him I would speak up and say mm-hmm. what I needed to do because I was I would say I was part of the silent majority. And I think this call, this call, you know, that we have to look, we have to ask if it if it isn't right for us all to think more deeply and to speak up because the time is now, we're at a crisis moment. Uh, our children are being assaulted and um, through, through these uh, gender surgeries. And uh, this is something that people can't uh, deny anymore. You know, mm-hmm. it's, a, it's a terrible thing. to They can't turn the cheek anymore. That would really uh, be a disaster. It's, it's, it, is, it is a disaster. And so... That's I try and get people me. to see this book Yes, shows how the American Revolution came out through the Reformation from Exodus and Deuteronomy, from the Jewish Torah. Mm-hmm. And ideas like constitution come from the Hebrew covenant. And you see in Exodus, we haven't got there yet in our roundtable, yeah. the consent of the governed. Or you have the separation of powers in the Old Testament. Mm-hmm. Many Americans have no idea where the roots of their experiment come from. So today you've got a real clash between people who believe in America and freedom, according to the original American Revolution, mm-hmm. largely biblical, mm-hmm. and those who under- believe in these things according to the ideas from the French Revolution, which are entirely different. And yes. they don't realize that. They will come out in very, very different places. And the French Revolution, that would be group. That would be group based. Certainly that. Yeah. But, you know, what other differences one is rooted there? in the Bible. Yeah. The other rooted in the Enlightenment. Mm-hmm. So the American Revolution has a realistic view of human nature. You have a separation of powers because people abuse power. Mm-hmm. So you have checks and balances. Right, right. That, comes, of course, from the biblical view, we're all sinners, and corruption is only too easy. The mm-hmm. French Revolution, utopian. Mm. Mm. Man is born free, Rousseau said, and everywhere is in chains. So remove a chain or two, right. take away all sexual repressions, and then we'll be happy, free, and fulfilled. Nonsense. <laughs> and so on. So you see radical differences all the way down the line, and they're working out very powerfully. So in the biblical revolution, right makes might. In the French Revolution, everything's power, and might makes right. Mm -hmm. And you can see how disastrously that works out. And Rousseau, the idea that nature is all good. Mm -hmm. 
He's the great thinker behind that. Oh, I see. Oh, dear. I didn't realize it was Rousseau. Mm -hmm. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) I only know a little bit about him, but I know that uh, people who believe in Rousseau have a feeling that nature is nurturing and and I, that I think that the environmental movement, the the whole the empathy towards the environment being to sacrifice people to to saving the environment, is that part of the whole Rousseau? Yes, philosophy? a very high and utopian view of nature. Yeah. Now the odd thing is, he's very utopian in thinking. But he was appalling. He had five children, Mm -hmm. mistreated them all. Right. You know, an an appalling personal record and the gap between his positive philosophy and his very negative life and so on is quite appalling. Yeah. You know, uh, Paul Johnson has a great book on intellectuals. Mm -hmm. And at the end of it, he said, at the end of looking at all these intellectuals, He says, two words come across, beware intellectuals. Right. They don't live the way they think and talk. Right, right, right. And that is the problem. If they put the intellect at the top, then God isn't at the top. It's not going to end well, Mm -hmm. you know, because the guidance is wrong. It's it's got the wrong aim. Well, that really goes back to one of the seven deadly sins, I would think, which would be pride. Mm -hmm. The... the, uh, if the intellect is thinking that that's the most important thing, arrogance, pride, those are the very similar and problems. As I say in the book, sadly, when you look at all the virtues, they have a shadow side. Right. And yeah. clearly calling is so wonderful. Mm-hmm. The idea that God has called each of us with certain gifts and we're precious and unique and we can be fulfilled in his eyes, mm-hmm. the shadow side is pride and conceit. I love the story I tell there of Winston Churchill, who had a member of his cabinet who was a Presbyterian and rather full of himself and somewhat priggish. And Churchill said at the one time after he left the cabinet room, Churchill shook his head and said, there but for the grace of God goes God. (laughs) (laughs) And sadly, that's the dark side of calling. Yeah, right. That you tend to think it's you. They tend things all about us. Yeah, that's right. You know, Rick Warren has a huge bestseller, The Purpose Driven Life, and he often says his opening sentence means more to the people than the whole of the rest of the book. He just says, it's not about you. Right, (laughs) right. You know, it was the great thing about calling. It is about us, but responding to him, the Mm -hmm. Lord. Yes. And so we're stewards and we're servants. Mm -hmm. But it's freedom. But it's freedom. It's freedom to take up that calling and know that uh, it's not not up to us to be the controlling and fixing of our environment that that God will tell us what to do and we can do it from there. It Mm -hmm. It takes a lot of the stress out of your day. Absolutely. You know, and so uh, if people would... Uh, just uh, meditate on that, meditate on that, and see over time how things change. You know, one of my favorite themes in the book, Mm -hmm. through calling, is the idea of everyone, everywhere, in everything. Mm -hmm. You know, our family, the Guinness family, were friends and supporters of William Wilberforce, Mm -hmm. you know, who abolished slavery. Yes, over 50 years. And he, he lived a pretty playboy life. Mm-hmm. until he was 26, mm-hmm. as he put it, whoring and gambling and clubbing, mm-hmm. and then came to faith and immediately thought, now I'm a Christian, mm-hmm. I should become a minister. <laughs> Mercifully, a minister, John Newton, the author of Amazing Grace, said to him, for heaven's sake, don't. Stay where you are. Ask God what he wants you to do where you are. Right. And two years later, he wrote what's reckoned to be the most audacious personal mission statement in history. God Almighty has put before me two great objects, the suppression of the slave trade and the reformation of manners, which is the old word for moral standards. Mm -hmm. Incredible Mm -hmm. vision. Mm -hmm. And he did both. Mm -hmm. 
Thank God he didn't become a minister. Yes, that's right. And no, so we're, someone we're not can supposed follow to run God. away from no. where we are. We're supposed to take up, take up our cross here, where we are. But in much of Christian history, calling was to become a priest or a monk or a yeah. nun or a minister. Right. No, and the Reformation said, no, you can, Martin Luther, you wash the dishes to the glory of God. Uh -huh. Or oh, I think actually his was you can change diapers to the glory of God. Uh -huh. And William Tyndale, you wash dishes to the glory of God. It's everyone, everywhere, in everything. And then people of faith who follow their calling become salty and light-bearing, and it's penetrating. The trouble is today so many people are sitting in their backsides and watching others do it. Yeah, right. And we need everyone in in the in the arena. We went to the opera Meister Singer when we were in uh, New York, and the Meister Singer is based on uh, there's the master there's the master singer that they they choose they choose the top singer, but all of the people who are going to be in the competition they're all shoemakers, mm -hmm. right? So they they are washing dishes, you know. They are they're they're built they're they're making shoes, they're shoemakers. So they're at the highest place. They're going to be spiritual leaders, but they also are at the lowest place in doing uh, a job that is using their hands and uh, actually putting shoes on people's feet, which is, you know, mm -hmm. you know, the, the, the idea of washing Christ's feet that there must be some sort of, I think, uh, um, um, some association in the in the opera about that, but I just thought of that. But I think that that's probably true. That we have to be where we are to make a difference. The loftiness isn't going to work. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but there's no higher, lower. There's no sacred, secular. It's everyone, everywhere, in everything they do. Yeah, and right. that's what makes life different. And. In. It's penetrated and engaged and so on, which we desperately need today. Yes, and we look we look at each other now and we see, oh, that, that someone has more than we do and that we want what they have. In, and uh, thinking that being somewhere other than you are is going to make the difference. Mm -hmm. But we don't know what it means to be that other person where they are. No, we need to be ourselves. Yeah, it's hard <laughs> enough to be ourselves, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, and impossible practically every day. Yeah, another theme in calling, which I love, is mm -hmm. do what you are. Uh huh. In other words, we're all unique. Some people are good with their hands. Some people are good with their mouths. Some people are leaders. Some people are administrators. We're all incredibly different. And the key thing is God's made us different. There's no diversity like the diversity of creation. Mm -hmm. The animal world and the human world, incredibly diverse. And the Bible encourages it. The odd thing is with modern diversity and the radical left, you end up with uniformity. Yeah. They talk diversity and end up with uniformity, whereas the great thing, do what you are. We're all different. We should be different. Mm -hmm. That's the beauty of individuality is everybody can, everybody can have their chance, but with the radical left, it's all groupings. It's yeah. all groupings. And so then the people themselves, they have no agency themselves because they're part of a group. Mm -hmm. And so that's a, it's in itself, I think it's a very uh, spirit killing movement because there isn't any individual uh, communication with your higher self. But again and again, you see these huge differences between, say, the American Revolution, I'm English, and you're Canadian, I'm, yeah, yeah. you know, but you can see the difference in the American Revolution and the French Revolution. But there's no leader in America calling people back to a better way. Mm -hmm. So you have in the, you know, the last time America was as divided as this was just before the Civil War. But you had a Lincoln and he addressed the evil, slavery, mm -hmm. and he called them to what he called the better angel of the American nature mm -hmm. with a great belief in the Declaration of Independence, and he called them back to what he termed a new birth of freedom. Mm -hmm. Now, you have a leader in Canada who hasn't a clue of any of that sort of stuff, and here 
There are wonderfully good people, but there's no one rising above the culture war fray and calling Americans back. And we need that. And we, we need it today a new, that. I say we need a new, new birth of yes. freedom right. right across the West, America, Canada, Britain, Australia, New Zealand, and so on. Oh, yeah. Well, we, we traveled in Europe. We didn't travel in Western Europe so much recently, but we went to Romania, Albania, Hungary, uh, Estonia, and uh, the the um, the outlook there about this cultural revolution that's going on in the West, they are shaking their heads, you know, they, they, and, and terrified that it's coming their way because they, it was only 1991 that communism fell there. Well, they know the alternative. Yeah, and they know. We began, the, I was telling you, I was, was born. Like 30 years ago. I experienced the first reign of terror under Mao Zedong. Yeah, wow. Once you've seen that, you know, um, as I said, I was a seven-year-old right. there. When I was at Oxford many years later as a graduate student, mm -hmm. I was at All Souls College, mm -hmm. which is the cream of the cream in England, mm -hmm. and one of the people at dinner was the fellow Sir Isaiah Berlin, the great Jewish philosopher. And as we were talking, it turned out he was a seven-year-old in the Russian Revolution. Mm. And I was a seven-year-old in the Chinese mm. Revolution. And we compared notes and, as it were, thanked the Lord that the West of that day stood against totalitarianism, Hitler yes. or whatever. Right. He would never have believed the inroads of cultural Marxism that you have here in America or in Western Europe. Yes. So the irony is Eastern Europe is more like the Old West. Yes. Whereas the Western Europe is anti-West in the old sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's quite extraordinary. But again, yeah. we need leaders to articulate it and call people to see what's happening, to make the choices and to come back to a better way. It's more free and more just and more human. Yeah. Well, so we also on. need the people to vote. Well, that's true. The right but, way. Yeah, but, you but know, the, I was the at leaders, a dinner in Washington, D.C. a couple mm -hmm. of months ago. Mm -hmm. Good people. Yeah. And it was a very interesting dinner. But I said to my wife when I got home, it was all trench warfare. Right. They're doing this. We've got to fight this. They've done. Mm -hmm. Nobody with a vision. You know, the English word strategic or strategy yeah. comes from the Greek word for a general. Oh, okay. And strategic mm -hmm. thinking is someone that sees the whole battlefield. That's what Lincoln did. That's what Churchill was like, mm -hmm. sort of panoramic view what Yates calls a hawk's eye view. Yeah, so if we're going to pray, we can pray for that. Absolutely. Right? Absolutely. Yeah, and so everybody who's listening, we can pray for that. We need uh, a visionary. We need a strategic leader to bring us to a, to, uh, back to uh, a place where our values are in order again with what is... Um, based in our Judeo-Christian heritage, because... Can I share a prayer, Tammy? Absolutely. Let's do that. <laughs> no, no, I don't mean pray now. Tell you a story yes. that's behind a prayer my wife and I pray every day. Mm -hmm. you know, just before World War II, there was a young Cambridge Don who was an atheist called Derek Prince. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was seconded to North Africa. And he took with him a number of classics he was going to read so that he could teach them when he came back to Cambridge after the war, he mm -hmm. hoped. Mm -hmm. And one of them he took was the Bible. And in reading the Bible, he came to faith in Jesus. Of course, no church, no chaplain, nothing. Mm -hmm. And the British Army had retreated or was in a retreat, 700, the longest retreat in British history, a scandal. The army was demoralized. The officers had more water for their horses and their gin and tonics than the men had to drink. It was terrible. Mm -hmm. Churchill fired the general, sent out another man who died en route. So Churchill had to send out a third man, young and untested. But back at the beginning of the retreat, Derek, this new Christian, he said, Lord, how do you want me to pray? And the Lord said to him, pray this prayer every day. Lord, set over us a leader such that it will be for your glory to give the victory through him. Mm -hmm. And he prayed that every day. And they were pressed all the way back to Alexandria. 
the big battle, and they were holding off against the Suez Canal mm -hmm. and from the Nazis getting Jerusalem. And, you know, the Nazis had a million Jews in North Africa identified to go the way of the final solution. Right. And the new general happened to be the son of a Christian leader back in Britain. And he got the army together and he said, let us pray to the Lord of the armies, which is the Lord of hosts in the Old Testament language. Mm -hmm. And when Jerry Prince was listening on his transistor, he wasn't there, the Lord said to him, this is your man. Mm -hmm. Prayed for him every day. And the next week was the Battle of El Alamein. And Churchill said, up till El Alamein, all defeat. After El Alamein, all victory. Mm -hmm. And we love it. So my wife and I, living in Washington, we prayed, Lord, so we turn it into the plural because mm -hmm. there are good women as well as men. Yeah. Lord, set over us leaders mm -hmm. such that it will be for your glory to give the victory through them mm -hmm. today. Mm -hmm. That's a good place mm. to wrap it up, I think, with that prayer. Well, thank you. Thank you very what much. What a pleasure to be with you. Oh, well, it's my pleasure indeed. Mm. Thanks. Thanks.